And Linda Clark's home, okay. Has she been in rehab or something for her knee? Okay. Okay. And it's good to see Sherry Cole back there with us this morning. I know she's good glad to be out. Yep, Linda's back with us. Anybody else? Have we heard, I haven't heard, uh, Nancy Palmer, have we heard anything? So she's still in the hospital, as far as we know. Okay. Yeah, Nitha. Any improvement in her? They would know. Okay, we're glad again to have Brother Jeff Miller with us here from Apology Express. My brain is full, but he's going to put some more in there now this morning. I don't know about you guys, but I, I really have enjoyed uh, sitting at his feet and learning all the what he has to present to us. I know if you haven't been with us Friday and Saturday, you're in for a treat today. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin, and then Brother Jeff will start talking to us again. Lord God in heaven, we're so thankful for this first day of the week that you've given us this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. We can see the creation of your hand and know that you are who you are and that you do exist. We thank you, Father, for every blessing of life that you have poured out upon us, especially the blessings that we have through Christ, the salvation through his blood shed on the cross, and the hope of heaven when we die. We pray, Father, that you would always bless us as you see we're in need and help us ever to be grateful for what you do for us. We're mindful, Father, this morning at this time of those that we have on our sick list. We ask, Father, that you bless them. Given them that portion of health they desire at this time, we're happy to see Sister Sherry back with us and ask, Father, that you continue to bless us, bless her and her recovery. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for our sins this morning, for we know from time to time we do things that we should not do, and we disappoint you. And, Father, we are sorry for doing this. And Help us to see temptation coming our way and avoid it at all costs. We thank you so much again for the church here at Walnut Grove, for the many good things that we could do. All to your glory, Father, to spread the borders of your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you bless us in our efforts to do what is right, to be the shining light in this community, and to help others see you and us. We pray, Father, that you would be with us in our study this morning and our afternoon study as well. Keep our minds open to what's prepared for us and help us to learn. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jeff. Hey, a lot to cover this morning, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, we ended a session yesterday afternoon looking at this Bill Nye Ken Ham debate that was, I can't believe it was 10 years ago. Uh, but Bill Nye, the pseudoscience guy, brought up several uh, salient points that Ken Ham did not deal with in that debate that I thought were uh, some really good points that, that say, serve as a test case to see whether the biblical creation model is actually able to withstand scrutiny. And so let's go through a handful of those today as, quick as quickly as we can this morning. Bill Nye said, you've got hundreds of thousands of years worth of layering in the ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. How can that be the case if the earth is only a few thousand years old? How do you have trees alive today that are older and even creation in some cases <clears throat> if the earth is young? How do you have civilizations with histories that go back beyond Babel and even the flood? Uh, how do you get animals to remote places like Australia if they're all wiped out in the flood? How do they get from the ark out there to continents like Australia? How do you uh, get from a handful of species, 7,000 on the ark, to the 16 million species on the planet today, which would be 11 new species emerging every day over the last 4,000 years in order to get to 16 million? And there's not even enough space on the ark for the 7,000 uh, representatives uh, on the ark anyway, he said. And a, a wooden vessel of the size of the ark, he said, could not be 
cannot possibly be seaworthy, and he cites a specific example of the Wyoming, which was a large wooden vessel that ultimately sank on the open seas uh, due to the, the length of their long wooden planks. All right, so let's go ahead and try to get through all of these in this session. First of all, his charge that how can the earth be young if you've got hundreds of thousands of years documented in the ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. So uh, in order to respond to this, you need to first of all understand what an ice core is. This is where scientists will drill down into the ice caps and pull up these cylinders of ice that have these <clears throat> striations. These are layers of ice that accumulate each year. And so he said, we've got hundreds of thousands of these in these ice cores when you pull them up. And so how do we respond to that? And so what we're going to see this morning is the importance of the material I presented yesterday and laying out the creation model and having some scientific theories that can help you to answer these kind of charges. And so the first issue with using this as a proof of an old earth is that it's based, once again, on uniformitarian thinking that I talked about yesterday. And that's the idea that whatever you see going on today, you assume it's always gone on that way throughout history in the past. And so if you've got one layer of ice forming each year in these ice cores, then you assume it's always been like that throughout history. But if more than one layer of ice can be deposited in a single year, it would destroy the assumption that these are hundreds of thousands of years worth of accumulation in these ice cores. And sure enough, that evidence exists. We know that individual storms and cyclical weather patterns can uh, cause layers to form that resemble annual layers, but they're actually subannual. So when you take into account the post-flood ice age that we talked about yesterday in our second session, uh, then the conditions would have been perfect for the accumulation of even uh, creationists estimate a thousand annual cycles each year uh, for a long period of time there after the flood. But also, modern estimates for ice accumulation in Greenland are less than one foot of ice accumulating every year. Uh, but again, we go out into the field and actually examine the evidence. We find that doesn't hold in many cases, even in modern times. So, for example, in 1988, ground penetrating radar was used to discover the location of some abandoned World War II planes from 1942. And surprisingly, the planes had been buried under more than 260 feet of ice and snow already, which is more than five feet of ice accumulating every year for the last 46 years, not the, the uniformitarian estimate of less than one foot per year. So even in modern times, the uniformitarian estimates uh, don't coincide with the actual observable evidence in many cases. Uh, so Bill Nye's use of ice cores to prove an old earth simply doesn't hold ice under scrutiny. Uh, number two, he argued you've got old trees like the bristlecone pine trees alive today that have been dated as being 6,800 years old or more uh, and then a Norway spruce tree, old Chico, that was dated as 9,550 years old. So how do we explain that? These trees would have had to have survived the flood and possibly even precede creation week, which would seem to be a problem for the biblical creation model. Well, first of all, you have to understand how they date these trees. You have to understand something about dendrochronology. Uh, dendrochronology is the study of tree rings, and it can tell you the age of the tree in some cases, but that's not all that this is about. It's also about studying the climate in the past. You can look at the nature of the tree rings, and it can tell you some things about climate in the past. Uh, but the idea is that each one of these rings represents another year of growth uh, for that tree. <clears throat> so... He mentioned old bristlecone pine trees that are six to 7,000 years old. And one of the things you have to do anytime a skeptic comes at you with, with some argument, make him prove what he's talking about, prove his case, which he doesn't really do that. He just makes that claim. The oldest living bristlecone pine tree was discovered in 2012 and dated at the time as 5,062 years old. Uh, so nowhere near the 6,800 he was claiming. And it was dated using tree ring counting uh, coupled with cross-dating. And so that means that if it really is 5,062 years old, then it started growing around 3,000 B.C. 
that be a problem creation model? Well, potentially, if you have it older than when the flood is supposed to have occurred, the biblical model places the flood as recent as 2300 B.C., based on the chronologies of Genesis, and coupled with history, that would be 4,300 years ago. But as I mentioned yesterday, room to expand that number a few years uh, based on the way that Moses deals with the chronology there. It's a little bit different than the Genesis 5 uh, chronology. So that already eliminates the problem that Bill Nye is, is asserting. But also consider that, once again, uniformity is assumed in tree ring accumulation. Uh, they're assuming one ring is accumulating every year. But again, we know today that when you have unusual situations, they don't, these tree rings don't always correlate with a single year. Sometimes rings will form sub-annually. When you have time-staggered, repeated disturbances caused by, guess what, unusual weather, then that will cause rings that correlate to, that are sub-annual uh, rings. So again, when you take into account the post-flood ice age uh, during the formative years of many of the, of the old, our oldest trees, then you could have had sub-annual tree rings forming. So it's possible that these bristlecone pines are actually se uh, several years younger than they appear. So where did he get 6,800 as opposed to 5,062 as the age of the bristle cones? Well, it's unclear. Again, he doesn't prove his case. So did he misspeak? Did he mean uh, not living trees but dead trees that have been dated using cross-dating? So this is where dendrochronologists will, <clears throat> will successively overlap tree ring patterns from living back to dead and even petrified trees to try to get a, a history of the trees and the climate throughout time. And as you can imagine, this is a very imprecise and often even subjective way to try to date the trees because we have trees alive growing in the forest. Tree ring patterns don't line up. And because this is affected by uh, the tree from water, uh, direction, uh, you know, the, the soil nutrients right there and wherever it is in the forest, the storm patterns. Uh, but even if this is assumed to be true, what he's saying, then they argue that it can date trees back and get a chronology back 8,000 years ago with the flood being four to 5,000 years and then uh, creation being only probably six to seven or six to 8,000 years ago. Uh, then this would mean that these trees go all the way back, potentially beyond creation, which would seem like a problem. But notice it's only potentially a problem, first of all, if you assume that all the trees could not have survived the flood. And that's an assumption. The text says all flesh died that moved on the earth. It doesn't talk about the planets, uh, the plants. Is it possible that there are uh, parts of the planet that had less turbulence than others, uh, from the things going on in the flood? Uh, is it possible that some trees, in fact, we would expect the pre-flood trees to have been more uh, robust because of the nature of the pre-flood environment and the, the less genetic entropy that would have gone on by that point in history. Bert Craig of the Department of Horticulture and Forestry at Michigan State, he even highlights that many tree species can survive for months underwater in flooding conditions. Horticulturalist Whitlow and Harris's monumental work on, uh, on the effect of flooding on trees, they document dozens of species that have been shown to be able to survive flooding for an entire growing season and even more than a year in some cases. So if trees could survive the flood, uh, either because they survived being underwater or because they were uh, brought on the ark with Noah, something like that, then even trees with over 6,000 rings wouldn't be a problem. Now that said, even if cross-dating could legitimately take you back thousands of years beyond the flood and even beyond creation in just uh, age-wise, then you also have to consider another important aspect of the model we talked about yesterday, and that is that the earth was created mature with an immediate appearance of age. So Adam and Eve, remember, are not fetuses, zygotes or something. They're already old enough to be able to uh, understand God's prohibition about the tree, uh, tend and keep the garden, procreate. Adam's doing biology by naming the animals and so forth. 
uh, starlight from distant stars would already be in place uh, by day six, since Genesis 1.14 tells us that the purpose of that starlight is for humans to be able to reckon time with. We would expect daughter elements and parent elements in rocks, so rocks are immediately going to have an appearance of being uh, very old in some cases if they're uh, radioactive rocks. And I mentioned that you would expect tree rings in the trees of the earth because tree rings, the purpose of the tree rings isn't just to tell us the age of a tree. They provide strength to the tree as it gets uh, bigger. Uh, without the tree rings, then the trunk's not going to be strong enough to hold the tree. And so we would expect trees to already have tree rings from the beginning. Uh, the Garden of Eden, they, they don't just have tree rings. The trees are already bearing fruit in order for Adam and Eve to be able to eat that fruit. So bottom line, tree ages can't even be conclusively known uh, due to the subjective nature of, of a tree ring uh, and dendrochronology in general and the subjective nature of cross-stating as well as the possibility of mature trees. Now what about the Norway spruce tree that he brought up, Old Chico? This is the one specific example of a tree he brought up, uh, as been, which was dated as 9,550 years old. Well, so when you dig into the evidence on this, you find out it used carbon dating, not dendrochronology. And so this isn't even typically listed among the verified oldest trees because scientists know that C14 dating is very imprecise and suspect beyond just a few thousand years uh, because now we know a lot more about uh, the climate in the past and so forth and uh, the Earth's magnetic field and how that affects C14 and so forth. But uh, uh, so now they're rejecting using C14 whenever you're talking about things this old. Notice what archaeologist Brian Fagan of UC Santa Barbara said. Carbon dating is not infallible. In general, single dates should not be trusted. And so tree ages simply can't be used to disprove the creation model. All right, number three, according to Bill Nye, you know, there are, there are human populations that are far older than that, the flood, with traditions that go back farther than the flood and Babel. So if that's true, then again, that would seem to contradict what the Bible says happened. All civilizations should have been wiped out in the flood, and then only those civilizations that emerged should have distinct to go back that far. Uh, so again, first of all, we have to ask, what civilizations is he referring to? Because he doesn't come out and say. So we're left to guess and make his argument for him, which is never a good idea to do in a debate. Is he talking about China? Uh, we have records that go back to 1600 BC in China. And beyond that, it's just uncorroborated legend that exists. And so Chinese history can't be said to be a problem. For creation, is he talking about Sumer? Uh, 2700 BC is the date for the earliest known Sumerian king. The Sumerian language is said to be the oldest written language. It's claimed to go back to 3100 BC. But notice that according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the chronology of the first half of the third millennium is largely a matter for the intuition of the individual author. Carbon 14 dates are at present too few and far between to be given undue weight. Consequently, the turn of the fourth to third millennium is to be accepted with due caution and reservations as the date of the invention of writing. So even the date of 3100 B.C. is speculative, and even if it's right, it still falls after possible flood date estimates, which can be as high as 3500 B.C. Is he talking about Egypt? Scholars consider 3100 B.C. to be the commencement of the first Egyptian dynasty. And again, it can't be known conclusively for the same reasons as Sumer. The inexact nature of tree ring dating and pottery comparison, C14 dating, and historical records. And some scholars argue that that date can be collapsed by a few hundred years into the 2000s B.C. But either way... All of these dates, China, Sumer, Egypt, can fit within the biblical time frame. But, so Bill Nye's argument doesn't carry any way, but I do, I do notice an interesting pattern. The oldest living trees date back to about 3100 B.C. The Egyptian dynasty goes back to about 3100 B.C. The origin of the written language in Sumer goes back to about 3100 B.C. With no verifiable civilizations beyond that. That's exactly what we would expect if the flood in Babel happened. So something significant seems to have happened before that time period 
that caused everything to just boom onto the scene uh, after that. So the post story of the flood is being verified from multiple independent directions converging together to make a point to us. Number four, if there was a flood and all the animals are wiped out on the planet, except those that are, that are on the ark, at least all the land animals, how do you get creatures out to Australia once they leave the ark? You know, how do you get the kangaroos out there? Uh, so keep in mind, if this is a problem for creationists, guess who it's also a problem for? I mean, how do you get animals out there even if you're an evolutionist? Because uh, they don't argue that they evolved from their own separate single-celled organism out there into koala bears and kangaroos. So how do you get creatures out there, even if you're an evolutionist, and whatever you come up with, why wouldn't the same argument be made by creationists? Now, number two, Bill Nye summarily dismissed the idea of a land bridge connecting Asia and Australia without any consideration uh, because, again, he's thinking, what, he's thinking in terms of what things are like today. Uh, but notice there's actually islands all along the path from China to Australia. The water between can be misleading if you don't take into account how things would have been in the past, especially from a biblical, a creationist perspective. You'll notice that the continental shelf of Asia actually extends all the way down there to the continental shelf of Australia with only a relatively small gap here between the two continents. And so it's <clears throat> whenever you consider that during the Ice Age, sea level worldwide would have been lower because of more ice being at the poles than some more of the land between uh, China and Australia may have actually been above water. Another option, remember we don't have a problem, we would actually predict the idea of Pangaea and remember Rodinia before that, the idea that all of the land was gathered into one place into one supercontinent. And remember Genesis 7:11 describes all the founts of the great deep breaking up. So the ocean floor seems to be breaking up, uh, commencing possibly plate tectonics. And you have some potential evidence there in Genesis 1 with all the water gathered in one place, which implies maybe the land was as well. So as we looked at in session four, simulations suggest that the movement uh, during the flood of the plates was very rapid on the order of meters per second uh, compared to today where they're moving slowly at centimeters per year. Uh, and so the continental separation rate is much faster in the past. So interestingly, recent research by Yale University geologists provides evidence for what creationists have argued about that. Uh, in fact, they're finding that it was at least three times faster in the past than it is today. Notice what they said. These observations suggest that either non-uniformitarian plate tectonics, so, so uniformitarianism is false, in other words, cat catastrophic plate tectonics, or an episode of rapid true polar wonder occurred, okay, so where the poles are actually shifting. We talked about that yesterday too. And it happened during the Cambrian explosion of animal life. You remember what I talked about yesterday, what the Cambrian explosion is to creationists is the beginning of the flood. It's very clearly the beginning of the flood. It fits perfectly with what we would expect. And so the scientific evidence is verifying what creationists have argued. When the flood starts, plate tectonics begins and the plates are moving fast. So if at the time right after the flood, the continents are a lot closer together than they are today, then that makes it easier for animals to get to some of these remote places. But there's other options as well. It's possible that the post-flood ice age would have allowed migration across certain frozen channels. We know that would have been the case across the Bering Strait as well as the English Channel. Uh, but another plausible option, there would have been no doubt dead trees, continent-sized islands of dead trees on the ocean in the years following the flood, making uh, floating land masses of material that animals could have traveled on. And, and somebody, oh man, well that sounds kind of hokey. Well, notice this picture from 2012 of Spirit Lake near Mount St. Helens. This is 32 years after the big 1980 eruption and there's still this big floating log mat on this lake from this catastrophic event. This is an image from the Telegraph out of the United Kingdom 
in the title of the article that had this picture, notice massive floating rubbish islands from Japan's tsunami spotted on the Pacific. So you have this massive catastrophic event. It makes an island of rubbish, okay, that's floating on the ocean. Um, and notice also, this is a picture of this floating island of debris, mainly wood, that is uh, floating across the Pacific toward the U.S. West Coast. And this particular debris island is 69 miles long and covers an expanse of over 2.2 million square feet. Now notice this picture. And in the description, it explains that the members of the Japan Coast Guard found and rescued that dog from one of these debris islands after the tsunami, three weeks after the tsunami. So you have an animal out on one of these islands for three weeks still alive, floating, on, floating out there. So it's not at all outlandish to suppose that massive debris islands would have been found all over the place after the flood and that animals could have been spotted floating on these for some time period. And as added evidence of the legitimacy of that, recent genetic analysis suggests that the marsupials in Australia, including the kangaroo, originated in South America before they got there. So how did they get from South America to Australia? Well, when you look at the projections of what the ocean currents would have looked like immediately after the flood during the Paleocene and the Oligocene, uh, then we see there actually would have been an ocean current moving straight from South America to Australia. And so ocean currents are argued to be how various creatures got from South America to the famous Galapagos Islands that Darwin was studying. So they actually use this to explain how you get uh, creatures to the Galapagos Islands. So this is not far-fetched idea. If you've got a tsunami in one small area of the world and yet it can make an island of debris like this that animals are floating on, then what would you expect to be the case if this is going on globally and you've got mega tsunamis going on across the planet? And of course, one final possibility as to how you get animals to Australia that evolutionists can't even argue is that humans could have brought them, right? That's not even on the table for them because humans aren't supposed to be around yet, but we would argue humans could have brought the kangaroos out there. That is a possibility. All right, number five, according to Bill Nye, you got 16 million species on the planet today, and if you've only got 7,000 on the ark 4,000 years ago, that would mean 11 completely new species are emerging every day after the flood over the last 4,000 years. And I gotta admit, whenever I heard that, I was like, wow, that's, that's a good point. How do we explain that? Well, so you gotta dig in, see what's going on with the evidence. <clears throat> and again, you, you should ask, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, first of all, where do you get this number? But, but one, he is at least accurate about one thing about his representation of the flood, we don't claim that every variety of animal that is around today, even necessarily every species, was on the ark. Uh, we argue what the text says. The species is a modern concept defined by humans relatively recent. The text says the different kinds are represented on the ark, perhaps a representative of the dog kind from which came that all the domestic dog breeds uh, including your wolves and foxes and coyotes, jackals, dingoes, and the variety of the domestic dogs as well. And we'd expect the same thing from the cats. And the creationists believe even that the Ice Age Smilodon belongs to the cat kind and may have been what was on the ark. Uh, the elephant kind includes your mammoths and mastodons. And so probably something more like the mammoth or the mastodon may have been what was on the ark. And the camel kind includes not just your modern camels, but your llamas and alpacas. And so creation biologists have been ironing all this out. The bears as well. There would have been single representative, even though we have a lot of variety of bear today. So a single pair of each of these would have probably been represented on the ark. Something more like the modern taxonomic category of family or genus. And so there's no need to fit every single modern variety on the ark, which would be difficult if not impossible. There's no need to because all of these varieties would have come about uh, afterwards uh, because that information is already in the genome of those proto-species that allows that diversity to happen. So there would have been represent representatives of each of these kinds that had this genetic material in them on the ark. So that's true 
from those original um, proto species, whatever they, however many there are, all of the current land and creeping thing species and birds would have to emerge through some kind of diversification process. Now, Bill Nye said 7,000 species on the ark. He said he was quoting Ken Ham. We don't really know exactly how many kinds there would have been. Uh, creation scientists are studying that. They're currently estimating more like 1,400. Uh, could have been more, could have been less. So Bill Nye said, so you'd go out into your yard. Notice, by the way, the scoffing here. 2 Peter 3, Peter warns there's going to be scoffers that make fun of you about the flood and creation if you believe that. So look, notice what Bill Nye says. You'd go out in your yard. You wouldn't just find a different bird, a new bird. You'd find a different kind of bird, a whole new species of bird every day. This would be enormous news. I mean, the last 4,000 years, people would have seen these changes among us. We see no evidence of that. There's no evidence of these species. You know, so you say things like this, and young people start feeling like, oh, man, I don't want to be an idiot, so I guess I better just reject the flood, right? Which is what's going on. We've got a mass exodus going on from our young people over, over scoffers like this. All right, so let's dig in, see what's going on here. And so first of all, we need to know again, where is he getting his 16 million estimate for the number of species? Where did he get that? He doesn't prove that. And, and that's the first thing you got to do whenever scoffers come at you like that. There's a lot of disagreement about how many species there are on the planet, and this is extremely high as an estimate. Some estimates are as low as 2 million species including an estimate published by Science Magazine in 2013. Uh, one study from 2011 that is still considered to be a very uh, good estimate. It's accepted by a lot of scientists, uh, so much so that it was published by the Public Library of Science Biology. They estimated not 16 million, but less than 11 million. And that estimate included not only the kingdom Animalia, but plantae, fungi, protozoa, chromista, archaea, and even bacteria. And keep in mind, these are estimates. The actual catalog number of species on the planet in 2011 was 1,438,769. They were projecting eventually they're going to find 10,960,000. Now, also, Nye needs to accurately reflect what the Bible, what the biblical model would claim. So from that 11 million, you need to take out marine creatures, okay, they wouldn't have been on the ark, of course, so removing your ocean-dwelling creatures brings you down under 9 million, and there's possibly other creatures that it could have survived uh, in the water as well, various amphibians, and we will leave them in there for the sake of argument. Plants, text mentions, uh, does not mention plants needing to be taken onto the ark since they're not flesh, other than what the passengers are eating, so that brings you down under 8.5 million. Now, uh, would the plants have all died in the flood if they're not taken on the ark? And no doubt, again, many certainly would have, but not all of them. Interestingly, most of the plants on the planet are actually underwater today. Uh, but also, seeds could have been brought on the ark, for all we know. Uh, perhaps more likely, you consider all the seeds that would have been available from all the dead plants floating on the waters of the flood that would have then regerminated whenever they landed on the post-flood world. And in fact, studies have shown that seeds can survive being submerged in salt water for extended periods of time. And ironically, guess who did one of those studies? Charles Darwin. Uh, so even he argued this as a way to get plants uh, to remote places. Uh, next, you have what are called synonymous species. This is important. This is where you have two names or more given to the same species. So creatures originally thought to be two distinct species that are now considered to be one and the same, which has happened, by the way, with a lot of the dinosaurs. They're now realizing the juvenile versus mature version of the dinosaur fossil. Sometimes they go through a lot of change, and so they've eliminated like 30% of the dinosaur species because of this issue. So there were two separate species being counted that are actually one. And so one creature, might his name may have changed over time, and yet both names are counted. And so these are synonymous species. And the PLOSB paper highlighted this weakness in their species estimates, explaining that a survey of 2,938 taxonomists with expertise across all major domains of life revealed that synonyms are a major problem at the species level. And in fact, they believe that 17.9% of all named species could be synonyms and possibly as much as 46.6%. 
the World Register of Marine Species even documents that 44.5% of all accepted marine species are actually synonyms. Now, if you take the lowest estimate, just for the sake of argument, only 17.9% of the remaining species are synonyms, that now brings us down under 7 million. So a far cry from 16 million, and yet we're not done. If the flood was 4,500 years ago instead of 4,000, which is closer to our estimate, that brings down the number of species that are emerging after the flood each day to four species rather than 11. But if there are fewer species than the projections, which is likely, more synonyms, which is basically de uh, uh, definite, more years since the, since the flood, which is possible, more species that could survive outside of the ark, which is certain as well, more representative kinds on the ark, very likely, then that number continues to plummet, and yet we're still not done. <clears throat> Insects, other invertebrates, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, those are all included in this list of 11 million species, even though, of course, they are not going to be represented on the ark necessarily. Invertebrates, for example, by themselves, make up 95 to 99% of the planet's animal species. Insects alone make up about half of the remaining 6.9 million species. And of course, the bulk of those would have survived outside of the ark, significantly reducing the remaining list even more. <clears throat> and then you take into account of those that are left, there would have been rapid speciation, especially of the smaller creatures. There's a correlation between how many more species there are that are the tiny ones versus the bigger ones. And we know, for example, that flies can lay as many as 100 eggs every day. Uh, according to the American Society for Microbiology, one bacteria can produce 10 billion in 10 hours. It's kind of creepy, right? And so many new species, varieties could have been rapidly emerging for a period of time right after the flood. <clears throat> So bottom line, 11 new species a day is nowhere near an accurate assessment of the data. Even four is a huge overestimate, and yet most of those would have been tiny creatures, completely unnoticed by humans, even though Bill Nye claimed that, that this kind of speciation would have been noticed by humans, and he scoffed about it. So consider, the Earth has a volume of over one trillion cubic kilometers. Humans only inhabit a tiny space of the Earth comparatively, and therefore, we're just not in a position to know what is going on all over the Earth or in the Earth. And so the odds that a species would happen to emerge in your backyard, much less that it would be large enough for you to notice it, is basically zero. But amazingly, <clears throat> in spite of that, here's the ironic thing. Guess how you've got scientists are still discovering 15,000 species that they've never noticed before every year. And guess how many newly discovered species that averages out to every day? 41. 41 new species that we've never noticed before are being noticed every day somewhere across the planet. <clears throat> Number six, according to Bill Nye. The National Zoo requires 163 acres to exhibit just 400 species. So how in the world is the ark going to hold 14,000 different species? Well, again, it's not uh, 14,000 animals anyway. Again, it's uncertain whether even 14,000 is a good estimate of how many creatures are going to be on the ark. But let's go with it for the sake of argument. First of all, the ark and the zoo, not a good parallel. The ark isn't about display. It's basic shelter. And so a better parallel would be a factory farm or high-density housing facility that can house tens of thousands of animals in, in tight quarters under one roof. But also, if the cubit is 18 inches long, which is what a lot of scholars estimate, so the length from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, then the arc would have been 450 feet long, so a football field and a half long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Uh, creation geologist and biologist John Woodmerab did an extensive study of how, how much space would be required to house representatives from all of the genus, and it, it was 16,000 animals, and he took into account food, water, waste disposal, heating, ventilation, lighting, and he found that the ark was more than adequate in size to house that number of animals on that size ark. But also consider what if humans were generally larger in the pre-flood period due to better health, 
and life longevity. Remember, you've got enormous reptiles, enormous plants, enormous uh, critters that I, we looked at yesterday. Uh, even the, uh, remember, we, in the numbers, you have the example of the massive um, fruit being carried by men on poles after the flood. And we even have a, have a mention of enormous humans in the pre-flood world as well. Uh, we talked yesterday about Homo heidelbergensis, where the evolutionists have highlighted that in the period immediately after the flood, we would say you've got a, huge, a group of huge humans that are around. So what if the cubit was long, longer than 18 inches at the time, which some estimates actually make it a lot larger than 18 uh, inches. So a 25-inch cubit, for example, instead of an 18-inch, would more than double the volume of space on the ark bringing it from one and a half million cubic feet to four million cubic feet. And of course, we would also reason that the animals would have likely been juvenile, uh, which, you know, why? You know, so their babies are adolescents. Why? Well, smaller animals, of course, are going to be easier to take care of. They take up less space. They eat less food, uh, make less waste. All right. And so younger animals would also, this is important, if God needs these animals to be able to repopulate the earth after, after the flood, then they need to be younger to have time to spread out and do that and have more babies. So you wouldn't expect full-size creatures to have been on the ark. So bottom line, there's plenty of space for the animals. Bill Nye's criticism doesn't disprove the, the biblical account. In fact, it gives it another opportunity to shine and show the biblical model is robust. Now, what about the dinosaurs, right? Uh, how do you get the dinosaurs on there? Well, creation scientists, we know with a high level of confidence where the flood begins in the geologic strata at the Cambrian, okay? And we know where the flood, we think, ends at the top of the, of the uh, uh, Mesozoic layers or at the top of the Cretaceous. And so the dinosaur fossils are found at the top of that, and they're still alive at that point because we see their footprints, Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means the dinosaurs are alive when the flood hits, which means if they're these land-dwelling creatures, then they would have been represented on the ark. So you got to keep in mind, though, the average size of a dinosaur is about the size of an American bison. And you also have to keep in mind that the juvenile form is even smaller. Even the big sauropod dinosaurs that are as big as this building start out in an egg this big. I've got a replica of one of them, of the uh, Titanosaurus uh, there at the at AP. So even the big sauropods start out uh, relatively small. And this picture should dispel virtually any, cri any criticism about the ark size. This is the full-size replica you have here in Kentucky. This little group of people is this group. And you see how tiny they are compared to the size of this vessel. Uh, so the ark is plenty large to house what God needs to be on there. Number seven, <clears throat> he, Bill Nye said... We've got a specific example of a pretty large wooden vessel, the Wyoming, that wasn't able to make it out there. It was so big that its, its wooden planks would twist and buckle and it caused leakage. So how in the world do you have uh, the ark that's even bigger? How can that be seaworthy? Well, first of all, as with the ark in, the, in a zoo, uh, the Wyoming and the ark aren't good to parallels. The Wyoming had six masts and several sails that would have created immense torsion as the wind is filling these sails on the open seas, which is definitely going to cause twisting and buckling. Uh, so the ark, of course, didn't have any sails because it didn't need to go anywhere. And so the torsion problem would have been greatly reduced, so not a good parallel. But also large ancient wooden ships have been found that go back to what we would say is the period immediately after the flood in Egypt. And we find that these boats are pretty sophisticated. They have an interlocking plank system of mortise and tenon joints. And mortise and tenon joints are known to help prevent twisting. And they provide added strength to the frame. So seaworthy large wooden ships were not out of question for the ancients. And again, uh, these boats are showing up immediately after the flood. This is probably some of the pre-flood technology that actually survives the flood through Noah and his sons. Also, number three, nobody knows what gopher wood was. God was very specific in choosing this particular wood. Now, Moses, he mentioned several other specific species in the Pentateuch, uh, terebinth and green poplar, almond, palm, willow, um, olive fig, pam uh, pomegranate, chestnut, and, and many of these, many others are mentioned in Scripture outside of the Pentateuch, and yet God chose this mysterious gopher wood. 
And there would not be a modern equivalent to this. You got to keep in mind all the genetic entropy that has gone on since creation. The pre-flood world is a totally different place. You would expect the trees to be way, way different, more robust, more strong than what we're dealing with today with all the genetic entropy we've had over the last 6,000 years. So there's, no, there's likely no uh, equivalent to whatever wood this was. And yet gopher wood was specifically chosen by God, not Noah, which tells us it must have been conducive to whatever God needed to happen for this boat to survive. Uh, number four, notice the Wyoming, in spite of its problems, stayed afloat for 15 years. Uh, the ark only needed to stay afloat for about one year. So bottom line, again, Bill Nye doesn't show the ark to be uh, unseaworthy, quite the contrary. Again, we get to see that the creation model is able to withstand scientific scrutiny. Now, interestingly, also concerning the engineering of the ark, the dimensions of, of the ark have been shown to produce the best uh, kind of vessel for the, for the nature of the kind of cargo that needed to be transported. So the SS Great Britain, for example, uh, in service back in the 1800s, had a dimension ratio of 322 to 51 to 32, almost exactly what the Ark was. Uh, the, uh, during World War II, you had a group of ships constructed, nicknamed the Ugly Ducklings. And similar to the Ark, these are cargo ships. They're built not for speed or combat. This is just to transport a lot of weight over the, the harsh sea. And the SS Jeremiah O'Brien, for example, one of those vessels, uh, has a dimension ratio, again, when you convert the ark's dimensions to feet, uh, very, very much lines up with the design of the ark. You have the uh, most recently designed super jumbo barges, which again are a better parallel. Uh, the purpose is to stay afloat while they transport immense amounts of cargo. And again, you have uh, length to width dimension ratios, very similar to the ark. Here's another good example, the very large oil uh, the very large crude oil carriers, the VLCC or the super tankers, they're linked with heightened meters, once again, very close to the arcs dimension ratio. So notice the trend, according to the latest engineering, if you want to build a boat that's intended to haul enormous amounts of material on the open sea, the best design is to use a length to width to height ratio like that of the arc. And so clearly somebody knew what he was doing when he designed this vessel. He was no amateur. All right, so Bill Nye brought up several other points that I deal with in the Reason and Revelation that I wrote uh, 10 years ago on this subject. So you can grab a, a free copy of that if we have any more back there. Otherwise, you can go to our website. And so bottom line, you know, the, the, um, the creation model is not able to withstand scrutiny, and so you're wasting your time. I don't even know why you're here. Uh, we're a bunch of ignorant hillbillies which may be true, but, uh, <laughs> but it's definitely not true, really, that the, uh, that the Bible, that the biblical model can't withstand scrutiny. All right, thank you for your attention this morning. We'll go ahead and pause there.